in our weekend flash sale, you'll get 12 weeks of the magazine in print and online for just £12. And we'll also send you a bottle of Johnny Walker Black Label Scotch Whiskey. Mm. To become a subscriber today, go to spectator.co.uk slash flash sale. The government has ordered enough vaccine doses for the entire British population. I'm told it's bought more per capita than any other country on Earth, based on the Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca jams. AstraZeneca, the one working at Oxford University on that. It seems many people, however, are reluctant to, about taking these vaccines that have been created in record time. Experts estimate that at least two thirds of the population need to be vaccinated to reach herd immunity. So how can the reluctant be persuaded to take the vaccine? Stuart Ritchie is a behavioral scientist at King's College London. He takes a stab at this issue in this week's edition of The Spectator, and he joins us on Spectator TV now. Stuart Ritchie, welcome, and thank you for your time. Uh, first of all, Stuart, tell us how widespread is this problem of vaccine skepticism, even vaccine denial? Well, just a few months ago, the uh, the polls looked really good. 85% uh, of people said that they would be willing to take the vaccine. Um, and actually, interestingly, it's got worse since then. You know, as we've got closer to actually having vaccines, the polls are looking less and less uh, good. Um, the Pfizer poll, for instance, there was a, a, a YouGov poll uh showing that about 67% of people said they'd be fairly likely or, or very likely to take it. Um, that's lower than what we'd need for herd immunity. Uh, there's different calculations that you have to do, of course, and it's not, you know, there isn't just one number for herd immunity, but it depends on the transmission rate of the, the, the virus and so on. But um, it's, it's, it's just about or just a bit lower than we'd really want. Um, and also it's more complicated than that. The, uh, the, the vaccine uh, spreads, uh, the, the virus spreads in clusters. And so we want to make sure that really much higher than the kind of basic herd immunity uh, threshold uh, uh, is vaccinated. So um, it's, it's quite worrying to see these polls and we really need to do something about uh, uh, convincing people to take this vaccine. There have been anti-vaxxer movements in the past. There's always a kind of hardcore of anti-vaxxers whenever vaccines uh, uh, come up. They seem quite militant about it. They're prone to conspiracy theories at time too. What I wonder though, Stuart, is, that, is this reluctance that you, you're in, you found, is, does this go broader than the, the, what I might say, the usual suspects when it comes to anti-vaxxers? Yeah, I think, I think in, in psychology, research, behavioral science research, whatever you want to call it, um, they're starting to use the term uh, vaccine hesitancy rather than anti-vaccine because um, there are people who are, are, are persuadable or possibly persuadable who are not just that hardcore. It does go further than that hardcore um, because people are worried about it. There have been incidents in the past where, uh, uh, you know, vaccines have been have been rushed and, and so on. And there did seem, especially in the US, to be sort of political involvement in this, trying to get the vaccine out before the election. Obviously, that didn't happen, but there, had, you know, there were sort of rumors of that, and I think that all casts uh, a really unfortunate doubt on on what has been a very, very uh, open and safe process. If you actually look at the science, um, it, it, you know, the 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 politicking has been really unfortunate. So, just to, to be clear on that, beyond the hardcore of people who seem to be against any kind of vaccine, uh, the, 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 there's a, a a bigger group that is worried because this vaccine was developed so quickly. That's that's clearly one aspect. I think um, people, understandably, want to see the safety data. I mean, we don't actually have full peer-reviewed papers for any of these three vaccines that we've been told about yet. They've been released in in press releases, and the initial data look good. And I think the incentives are not for the vaccine companies, the pharma companies, to be you know misleading us on this. I think the incentives are are you know for them to be truthful and, and open about this, and they have been open about some uh, uh, um, you know, uh, aspects of the, of, the, of the protocols of the, the studies. AstraZeneca, there's a few more questions, but Pfizer and Moderna have been amazingly transparent and open. Um, uh, and so I, you know, I kind of look at the, the vaccine development as sort of a bright spot in the science on COVID, which has been very patchy uh, overall. But um, I think people are understandably saying, I wanna see the paper, I wanna see the, the, the safety data, I want it to be assessed by the experts before I make a decision. That's, that's fine. And I think the, the pharma companies should be you know, uh, having absolute rocket boosters under their um, paper writing. They should all be writing up their papers as quickly <laughs> as possible to try and convince people. Uh, I want to come on to how you think we can nudge people <clears throat> to the vaccine. But before I do, let me ask a more fundamental question. 
is it really just out of the question in a democracy to make the vaccine mandatory? Well, it's not out of question in some democracies. So some democracies nearby, uh, for instance, France uh, uh, has several vaccines that are mandatory. This is in this is in kids. Um, yeah. uh, um, the, the the US has uh, mandatory vaccines for, for going to school in many states, depends on the state. Uh, Germany has some. Australia has these uh, no jab, no pay laws where you don't get your child benefit unless your kid has been uh, vaccinated. So there are some com uh, countries that do either compulsory vaccination or, you know, stop you getting your full government benefits and so on if you, if you, if you don't get the vaccine. It's not something we have in this country. Um, and I actually think it's uh, it, it's probably not going to be necessary in this case. I think there's a huge clamor to to get to get vaccinated, and I I, I don't think we're going to necessarily need it. Um, I think we can use incentives, you know, that are carrots rather than sticks. Well, give us some examples. How would we nudge people uh, with a carrot and perhaps with a stick uh, towards taking the vaccine? Well, I mean, the most obvious one is simply to pay people to take it. Um, I think it, it, the government should be very thinking very carefully about uh, paying people, especially younger people who might think that the vaccine, oh, it's not for us. You know, the, 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 this, this virus really affects older people. They're at risk of severe disease. I'm not really, I'm, I'm maybe just going to get a mild illness for a while. I think um, obviously that's that's the wrong reasoning because uh, the, the the virus spreads, including from, from younger people and including from people who, who don't have symptoms. And so... Um, uh, I think the government should be thinking very carefully about paying uh, uh, younger people particularly to, to have a vaccine. Maybe uh, it's been suggested £200 for a, for a shot, particularly important as well because you might need two shots. So you might need to incentivize people to come back for the second one. Um, and, you know, you do get a lot of attrition in these kind of in these kind of interventions. Um, so that's one thing. There are other things in the, in, in the literature. The psychology literature is not particularly impressive on this topic of, about changing people's minds. So making people who are, are worried about the vaccine or are actually hardcore anti-vaccinators, um, making them change their mind. We're not really very good at that. We're not very good at persuasion. But there are some things, you know, um, making people set specific appointments and times that they can go and get the vaccine, making sure that the, the, the clinics are easily accessible. Um, these kind of nudges can, can, can work. But actually changing people's minds we're just not very good at that. Could there also be a way in which society penalizes the people who refuse to take the vaccine? For example, an airline could say, if you haven't got the vaccine, you're not flying in our airline. Or yeah, even a I restaurant owner might say, if you haven't got the vaccine, you're not dining in our restaurant, which is now rather crowded. Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, there's private incentives as well. So we saw the CEO of Qantas uh, saying that he's going to, I think he hasn't officially said, but he's, he's thinking about it. They're, they're considering having some kind of, um, so you have to show your passport for an international flight. You might also have to show your immunity passport for an international flight um, and maybe even domestic flights as well. He was talking about in, in, in Australia. So um, I think that private companies can 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 do this as well. And it's not just that they um, that they should do this because it's a it's a useful thing to, to, to do for for building herd immunity. But it's also I mean, it, it makes people feel safer. It's going to make people want to use these companies. James, is the, is the government worried about vaccine skepticism? Does it feel that there'll be resistance uh, among a, a, a decent sized chunk of the population? I, I don't mean they're worried about vaccine scepticism in the first instance. I think, I think their view is that, you know, initially the take up will be quite high. I think the question will, the worry will come if you haven't hit, uh, we know from these leaked NHS documents, they want to hit 75% by April. And I think if you're struggling to get to that number, then I think you get into more difficult rounds of, as you said, how do you nudge people to take the vaccine? Uh, I think the problem is lots of the nudges that people talk about, like paying people to take the vaccine and the like, I think might well actually have the perverse effect of increasing people's scepticism of the vaccine. Uh, I see what you mean, because they feel they'll be kind of bribed uh, uh, to, to do it. I can... What do you say to that, Stuart? It's an interesting point. Yeah, I think these backfire effects are, are definitely the case. I think particularly if it was compulsory, people would think, well, wait a minute, why aren't we giving, why aren't we being given a choice here? Are they hiding something about the safety of this uh, uh, vaccine? Um, uh, and particularly, you know, um, and being paid, which is why I think the being paid thing could be directed at specific uh, uh, portions of the population rather than just rather than just everyone. Um, but yeah, I think, I th look, I think we're in a really lucky position here. The vaccine is really safe. It's uh, the Moderna and the Pfizer ones seem to be amazingly effective, you know, 90 percent, 95 percent. And so actually, I think the aspects, the, the, the properties of the vaccine itself uh, are reasons why we won't have to 
you know, bend over backwards to get people to take it, people are going to be really desperate to take this vaccine. And, and um, you know, it's not just like a routine health appointment. In this case, it's your whole world opening up again. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, and so I think th- there are reasons to be optimistic about this, although we need to think carefully and we need to be flexible too. We need to, you know, keep a real eye on those numbers and, uh, and, and, and put in some new policies in place if, if, you know, we're not getting up to that level of herd immunity. Final issue, and uh, I'll uh, come to Katie, then finish off with you, Stuart, uh, here. Uh, Katie, you've written about the question surrounding the, the order, the priority of who should get the vaccinations uh, first. What, what's the government thinking on, on this yet? Is there a clear uh, order of priority uh, developing as government policy? Yeah, so the government priority is is pretty clear, which is the vulnerable and the aged first, as well as health workers, NHS workers, and they've print you know they publish documents about this, and I think that if you there's some questions clear about the Oxford vaccine, though there has been good news on the surface at least, but ultimately if we're faced with a scenario where the vaccine's first approved, we have limited supplies on, and also just in terms of the choice of the highest you know, efficacy, that will go to um, you know, the 55 and overs first, as well as NHS workers uh, too. However, uh, if we are in a situation where we have limited supplies of vaccines, expect to see Tory MPs questioning the order because there's already been some, uh, you know, uh, toing and froing from Tory MPs saying, if you can't vaccinate, you know, 75% of the country, then actually there is an argument that perhaps you vaccinate uh, working age people first, people who need to get out there and do things, rather than vaccinate those who aren't really going to be going out there and taking part in society in such a way. And I think that debate rests on ultimately, you know, how how many doses there are to go around. If Ox is approved, it, it, it will probably diminish. And um, I think one other thing, just when we're talking about how you get people to take um, vaccines, uh, recently there was a Tory MP who wrote on the Tory MP WhatsApp thread that perhaps MPs should be at the, you know, near the front of the queue. And they were quite quickly shot down. People uh, suggested this would be a bad look. Um, but there was interesting polling, I think, in the Daily Mail, which was um, saying that actually quite a lot of the public believe that um, if their MP took it first, it would give them confidence. Um, so I think that is one to watch. Um, perhaps we're going to get vaccinations in the chamber. Oh, very well. Get them live on television. Why not? Could be, uh, it could replace Strictly when it comes to an end. Uh, <laughs> Stuart, final question with you. Uh, what do you think the priority should uh, be, this idea of working age people should get it first? I mean, I always thought that the natural thing to do would be people at the front line, NHS and so on, then those most vulnerable, the older, and then those with, uh, particularly with underlying comorbidities, and then those of any age with these comorbidities, and then everybody else. Is that is that wrong? No, that, that, that seems very sensible to me, although there will be... Um... Modeling studies that will show, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that there, there are uh, epidemiologists working right now on uh, studies that will, you know, um, uh, simulate different strategies that we could take. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it really all depends on the, uh, uh, the effectiveness of the vaccines, too. So if this uh, AstraZeneca vaccine is 70 percent effective, that's going to mean a different model from if it's 90 percent effective. And we really don't know the answers to that yet. So a lot of this is going to hinge on, um, particularly because the government has bought you know, it, it, its largest pr- uh, proportion of, of vaccines that it's bought are, it, it are the AstraZeneca ones. Wow. So it's really going to depend on, on how effective those vaccines are. So we really need to see from Oxford as soon as possible that paper giving all the details of all the uh, the protocol, how it was changed, uh, um, uh, if, it, if indeed it was changed, uh, and, and not, you know, not only that, but also the safety information. And then we can start modeling who we should be giving the, the vaccines to first. Mm-hmm.